Hello, everybody, and welcome to TAGC Online. My name is Denise Montel, and I'm president of the Genetic Society of America, or as we'd really prefer to call it, the Genetic Society for All. GSA is a society for scientists anywhere in the world, at any career stage, who use genetics in their research. GSA's mission is to advance science and scientists through professional development programs, art journals, genetics, and G3, advocacy, and conferences like this one, the Allied Genetics Conference, or TAGC. GSA is a community of scientists who work on diverse organisms, and TAGC is designed to bring us all together in order to stimulate the exchange of ideas between, as well as within, our individual communities. If you have read the book, The Tangled Tree by David Quammen, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't, you should. If you're interested in genetics and evolution, it's a page turner. The central thesis is that rampant horizontal gene transfer between organisms has been a major driving force in evolution, especially early in the history of life and certainly amongst prokaryotes, but perhaps to a greater degree um, in eukaryotes than many of us have recognized. Whatever your scientific opinion about horizontal gene transfer in eukaryotes is, it's a perfect metaphor for the Allied Genetics Conference. The goal of this conference is to stimulate rampant horizontal idea transfer between organism communities in order to accelerate the evolution of the field of genetics. It was heartbreaking to have to cancel the in-person version of this conference, which included four years of planning, not only of the scientific program, but also the complex meeting logistics. I'm absolutely thrilled that in just a few weeks time and in the midst of everything that's going on, GSA has risen to the occasion, shown remarkable resilience and adaptability, and pulled together this online version of the conference. I'd like to give a huge shout out to the GSA staff and TAGC program committee for rising to this challenge. So here we are, ready to engage in the gigantic collective experiment that is TAGC online. We're here to share our work and ideas, our plans for the future, staying connected even while apart. One of the silver linings of the current disaster is that we decided to open this conference free of charge to anyone who wishes to participate. And the response has been fantastic. Ironically, by forcing us apart, COVID-19 has enabled 10,000 of us, more than three times as many people to share in this event. While some benefits of an inter-person meeting have obviously been lost, um, new opportunities for idea exchange might just have grown exponentially. It's just possible that we have stumbled on a whole new mode of interaction. We are grateful that to have some support from sponsors and exhibitors to help offset the cost of the meeting. But please note that GSA, like many individuals and organizations, has been hit hard financially. The one thing we ask is that if you appreciate the ability to participate in this conference, we simply ask you to join the GSA. Please go to uh, genetics-gsa.org and join today if you haven't already. And if you're fortunate enough to be able to afford even a little bit more, we welcome any additional donation you might be able to make. Like any new experiment, this online conference raises some challenges. We ask for your patience and understanding if and when technical issues arise we will keep everyone updated via email, the website, and Twitter if there are any changes to the technical instructions or to the program. For those unfamiliar with TAGC, the concurrent oral presentation sessions include some that are organized around a scientific theme and others that are organized by community. Our keynote sessions are intended to span and integrate the community. Don't miss the late breaking keynote session tomorrow that will feature frontline COVID-19 research from Richard Nair at Bio Centrum and Leah Starita at the University of Washington. I also want to draw your attention to the diversity, equity, and inclusion session and the associated posters organized by our wonderful Equity Inclusion Committee, who have been working really hard on new initiatives. In addition, 634 posters are available for viewing this week, and many of the presenters will be taking questions in Zoom meetings next week. We hope you'll visit the posters and engage with the scientists who've worked hard to present their research. Then starting May 19th, we'll have a series of two hour workshops, including publishing and career development, grants and funding, education, scientific writing, and more. These look really fantastic. So check them out and sign up. 
please join some of the interesting discussions already going on on the TAGC Slack channels. I encourage you to take a minute to visit our sponsor and exhibitor Slack channels and videos and thank them for their support, for your support while you're here. Even though we're all online now, I wanna remind you that you're still expected to follow our conference code of conduct, which has been modified for this virtual environment. That means being mindful and respectful when you ask or answer questions or interact on Slack or in live post or Q&A uh, sessions in the workshops that you're not engaging in, um, make sure that you're not engaging in any of the unacceptable behaviors listed in the code. Details about the expectations and reporting procedures are posted on the TAGC website. Thank you to everyone who's worked so hard on TAGC and thank you especially to all the presenters and speakers who've joined us in this experiment. Okay, so let's get comfy and enjoy the talks. Uh, now I'd like to introduce the moderator of our first plenary session, past president of GSA, editor-in-chief of genetics, Mark Johnston. Mark, over to you. Thanks, Denise. And welcome everyone, all 10,000 of you. Uh, as Denise said, we have nearly 10,000 registrants. That's amazing. We're glad you're all here. THEC 2020 was organized by members of the GSA community, your colleagues and peers. I'd like to thank them, the members of the Allied Program Committee, who helped envision the big picture of TAGC, which is about bringing scientists together across organisms, topics, career stage, place of work, and geography. The Allied Program Committee, which includes representatives from each of the participating research communities, put together the thematic cross-organism sessions. Allied Program Committee members also identified and recruited the keynote speakers. Thanks committee members for all your hard work. It was great working with you and I'm proud of the program you've assembled. And thanks also to the members of the seven community program committees who volunteered their time and talent to shape TAGC. They built a scientific program that showcases some of the most interesting research coming out of their committees. Our committees have put together a terrific program. I hope you're all as excited about it as I am. I'd also like to thank our sponsors whose support made THEC 2020 online possible. Please give them your support by visiting their virtual exhibits and their Slack channel and with your patronage. And I want to thank the poster presenters for enriching this conference. I encourage all registrants to attend the live poster sessions scheduled for next week. And last, but definitely not least, I want to thank GSA staff who made TAGC 2020 online happen. That includes Anne-Marie Mahoney and Susie Brown, GSA's meetings directors, whom many of you know very well, Christy Gelling and Jacqueline Trabashi in communications, Sarah Bay, GSA Journal's assistant editor, among other things, Ruth Isaacson, GSA Journal's Managing Editor, among other things. Aaron Suderman, who spearheads GSA's Engagement Department. Hubert Zhang, who keeps IT humming. Drew Elias, who made the web pages easy to navigate and nice to look at. Mary Van Tyne, who did lots of clutch things. And Executive Director, Tracy DePellegrin. They all worked as a team and did a remarkable job organizing this online conference on very short notice and with no prior roadmap. I know I speak for many in our community when I give you guys my sincerest thanks for your hard work putting this unique conference on. You guys are truly amazing. And now it's time to kick off TAGC 2020. I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker, Alex Shear from Harvard University who will present Cellular Biographies, Reconstructing Zebrafish Development. Alex? Great, thanks. All right, looks like this is all working. Um, well, thanks so much for having me, uh, I guess, in my office, but um, Still, it's great to be part of this community and uh, thanks so much for moving the whole thing online. Uh, I wish I could hang out with all of you guys, but um, this is still better than nothing. And 
you know, it also reduces our carbon footprint. So I think this is, this is good. Um, so um, let me uh, start by uh, introducing the, the, the main contributors to what I'm going to tell you. Um, they are Jeff Farrell, a postdoc in the lab, who now has his own lab, just opened it at NIH. Yi Chen Wong, a grad student in the lab. Uh, Jamie Gagnon, uh, who uh, was a postdoc, is, has now his own lab at the University of Utah. Uh, Bushra Raj, a postdoc in the, in, in the lab, who will soon have her own lab. And Summer Time, a former postdoc who now has her lab at the University of Alabama. And uh, several other people in the lab contributed to this work. And uh, much of this was were great collaborations with Alan Klein and Dan Wagner, uh, Aviv Regev and her lab, and uh, particular Jason Dury and uh, people in his lab, uh, particularly Aaron McKenna. So I start with a quote from uh, Sidney Brenner, the late Sidney Brenner, who said, progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably in that order. And um, what I would like to do today is uh, basically share um, some of our experiences with single cell genomics techniques um, to um, reconstruct developmental trajectories and lineages. And so um, we've been working in this field for quite a while, and uh, I think it would be, uh, it, it would be fun to uh, share some vignettes of uh, our experiences with you, what these kind of technologies can do, also what they cannot do or what they cannot yet do, and how we have applied them to uh, different uh, biological problems. So I start with um, um, introducing the concept of trajectory and, and lineage. This is, of course, well known to many developmental biologists. biologists but uh, with lineage, we mean the pedigree of cells according to cellular ancestry. So this is really about how cell divisions um, create a pedigree between cells. And so who's my mother, who's my um, sister cell, who's my grandmother, grand grandmother, etc. And of course, the most famous case uh, example is the C. elegans lineage tree, where we know basically the full division pattern of, of somatic cells. This is in contrast to what we call molecular trajectory of cells towards a specific fate. So this is called molecular trajectory, um, where basically the best illustration, I think, is still the Waddingtonian landscape, where you have a cell rolling down a hill and then choosing or being pushed into different valleys as it becomes more and more specialized. And so as this cell becomes more and more specialized, differentiates, uh, there's a particular um, trajectory, molecular trajectory of gene expression changes, for example, uh, it undergoes. And so there's a difference between lineage and molecular trajectory. Uh, for example, if you think about your left and your right eye, they probably have se very similar molecular trajectories, these cell types, because they're identical between the left and right eye. But the lineages, of course, are separated very early between the left and, uh, and the right eye. So their lineages, their lineage trees, they look uh, uh, different. And so one of the challenges right now in the field is actually trying to kind of combine these ideas of lineage and, and molecular uh, trajectory. So uh, we do um, all our work and I kind of call this reconstructing cellular biographies in, uh, in zebrafish. And so this is, of course, another uh, view of zebrafish development, kind of a global view uh, of zebrafish development. Some of it is single cell too, uh, using imaging, and where you basically see the rapid cleavage divisions, the patterning starts now, then cells move around. And after 12 hours of development, you already have kind of the major outline of the body plan. So here you have the eye and the brain, the, the somites, the heart would be somewhere here, here's the tail bud. So basically you have uh, many different uh, structures. And so at this view of development, of course, we cannot see where the genes are expressed, but now single cell sequencing, of course, allows us to take these embryos, dissociate them, and then ask, what is the gene expression repertoire of individual cells? And when you do this at this stage, it looks like something like this. Um, so you get about a, a dozen, a two dozen different cell types. So this is at 12 hours of, of development. Each of those little dots is a cell. So here we have some blood islands. Here we have epidermis, endoderms, somites, and axial cells, notochord. So you basically can define all the major cell types um, through single cell gene expression and then using different approaches of clustering at these cells uh, together. So this is a snapshot at one stage of development. And what you can now also do, of course, is to take different snapshots over time 
and then try to reconstruct how these cells um, um, are arranged in gene expression space, how are they related in gene expression space uh, to each other. And so in kind of a simplified movie, this looks like this. Basically, we, we took the stages that I showed you in the movie and we'll take these embryos and then dissociate them and then do single cell sequencing of all those cells and then use computational approaches to arrange them in this kind of uh, tree, trajectory tree of development. So again, each of those little dots is an individual cell. And what you see here at the, at the base of the tree at the root is already during very early development, you already have three different cell types. You have extra embryonic tissue here, germ cells, and then embryo proper. And then as you develop here, you become uh, an either axial mesoderm, so dorsal mesoderm, the rest of the mesendoderm and endoderm, or ectoderm. And then here you see other um, bifurcations or trifurcations where you have, you know, let's say here the skin and, uh, and, and the nervous system. So this turns out to be a very powerful approach to define the kind of trajectories and also the, the um, relationship of cells in, in gene expression space. Um, but what we really like about these trees the most is the ability to reconstruct where all the genes uh, are expressed. And so I'll give you an example here. So we're gonna look at this particular trajectory as a cell goes from this early you know, blastomere stage to a more and more differentiated cell type, in this case, the, the precordal plate. So this is shown here again. And now what we're gonna do, we're gonna map different uh, gene and their expression patterns onto this, onto this tree. And the power of this approach is that you not just see what's expressed here, but also where else it is expressed. So we start with a gene that's expressed relatively early here. And then we have a gene that's expressed relatively late. And now we basically go through all the genes that are enriched in here. You see they're all expressed here, but you also can see that many of them are expressed in, uh, in, in different tissues. So this gives you a really very deep view of gene expression of the entire genome in uh, time and uh, with respect uh, to cell, uh, cell type. And so what are the kind of applications we can now do with these kind of uh, data? So I'll give you uh, three examples. The first one actually will be covered by Jeff Farrell tomorrow in his talk, which is basically using this, um, these gene expression uh, trajectories and try to figure out what kind of genes are co-expressed at particular times, and then trying to figure out from that co-expression if these genes define a particular cell biological module. And so what, we'll, what Jeff will tell you tomorrow is basically that if you do this for this particular trajectory, the notochord, you can actually find early on, you have specification genes, then you have the unfolded protein response, later you activate midline repulsion genes, et cetera, et cetera. So you activate these different modules that allow you to recreate and reconstruct what happens in the cell biology as this tissue becomes from you know, very early precursor to highly uh, differentiated uh, cell type. So Jeff will tell you this tomorrow in, in this session on um, 5.15 in the afternoon uh, um, um, DC time. What I will tell you about are two examples. One uh, where we use um, this kind of approach to identify a previously unrecognized cell state. And in the third, to um, uh, use this uh, for phenotyping uh, mutants. So let me start with the unrecognized cell state. So here we basically use the single cell uh, transcriptome data and basically just you know, sorted cells according to differential gene expression. So here you have you know, different genes that are differentially uh, expressed. Here you have individual uh, columns or, uh, or, or cells. And you see there's a group of cells, or there are many group of cells, but here's one group of cells that clusters together that had a gene expression repertoire or landscape that we did not know about uh, before. So there are expressed, for example, DNA damage response genes, P53 related uh, genes. Um, there are also um, um, stress response genes, immune genes, uh, the old mental genes. And so this seemed very interesting. And then we did an in situ uh, hybridization with this. And uh, what we found is that um, these genes are expressed in this kind of a very funny, strange salt and pepper uh, pattern. So you see your individual cells express this and other cells do not express it. And actually it looks different in every embryo, but if you actually do um, double in situ, you see that these genes are actually co-expressed. So you know, this gene here is co-expressed with this gene, 
And uh, this is true at the single cell level, consistent, of course, with the single cell data. So there's clearly a kind of a previously not uh, recognized, unrecognized program of genes that are co-expressed in the cell type at the end of um, uh, blastula at the, at the, uh, prior to a gastrulation. So what might this program be? We do not yet know what this program might be, but we have a hint that it might have something to do with DNA um, uh, damage. So, um, and, and Jeff, who, who discovered the cell type, calls them the, the seven uh, sleepers. You can look up in Wikipedia why he might call this um, a seven sleepers. So here again is wild type. And then if we challenge the embryo with foreign DNA or heat shock, you know, we don't see much of a, of a change. But now if you introduce a DNA damage, uh, what we find is that um, we can dramatically uh, increase the expression of these genes. So if you introduce double strand breaks with gamma irradiation or uh, with Cas9 introducing a simul, single uh, DNA double strand break, you get the activation of this program. Importantly, we think these cells do not die, um, but actually survive and um, you know, become uh, differentiated uh, cells. So we don't think this is just kind of a death apoptosis program. And instead, the way we think about this at the moment is that during these early stages of development that I showed you in this movie, that there were rapid cleavage divisions and there's no G1 and G2 phase and there's no checkpoint really. So what we think is happening that there's some kind of DNA damage. This can be, get repaired. We know this also from a CRISPR-Cas9 experiment that the repair can happen very early after double strand breaks. And then this repair basically induces a memory of DNA damage response. So the cell knows that earlier in its life and in, the, in, its, pro, in its precursors that there was some DNA damage and DNA damage uh, repair, and that this now turns these cells potentially into quiescent or senescent cells instead of making them you know, stem cells, which would be bad if they're full of mutations, or killing them, which would be kind of a waste after having invested so much into making these uh, embryos. So that's what we're, um, what we're trying to find out now. And if you are actually interested in, the, in this question, you should uh, join Jeff's lab, who's now at, uh, at NIH. So second um, uh, example that I want to give you, how we use the single cell genomics data, is um, by looking at the roles of schizophrenia-associated genes uh, in, uh, in zebrafish. And so this was a screen uh, done by Summer Time in the lab. And uh, she was curious about what might schizophrenia-linked genes be doing? Because as you know, there are many um, GWAS studies that um, link particular regions of the human genome to particular diseases, but it's often unclear what the key genes are in those regions and um, what those genes might be doing. So she made 132 zebrafish mutants in the author logs of these, of these um, putative schizophrenia genes, and then um, did a very large phenotypic assay where she looked at the locomotion of these mutants. Um, so kind of a behavioral assay where she also looked at the brain structure and the activity, uh, brain activity uh, of these mutants. And that was very interesting because she found you know, some interesting functions for many of these genes. She also saw that certain genes are related in what brain structure or brain region uh, they affect. So some kind of common theme for some of these genes. But of course, this is a still a very um, you know, high resol uh, low resolution approach to phenotyping these, uh, these mutants. And so I show you one mutant here, ZNF 536. This is a, um, a, a zinc finger a transcription factor. And so based on her studies, we knew it had some abnormal uh, behaviors. It also had some uh, changed activity here in the forebrain, here in the, here in the midbrain. But we didn't really know exactly what this, you know, what kind of cell types might be affected. And so again, single cell sequencing actually helped us a lot here. And so what we, what we did, we basically isolated again cells from the brains of the wild types and the mutants and then um, identified uh, which uh, cell types they correspond to, and then ask, is there under or over representation of particular cell types in the mutant versus the wild type? And this was actually a striking result because we discovered that there are three clusters in the, in the mutant where, uh, in, and in the wild type, that where you don't see any cells in the mutant in two of those clusters, or a fewer, many fewer cells um, in, the, in the mutant compared uh, to the wild type. So, um, so this was uh, kind of interesting. And conversely, we saw that there's one cell type here where you seem to have twice as many cells of that type in the mutant than in the wild type. And when we looked at what these cell types uh, might be, we saw 
that the ones that were missing or reduced in the mutant uh, express markers of differentiated um, um, uh, neurons that are involved in stress response in social behaviors. So it might be a stretch, but might have something to do with schizophrenia. So these are underrepresented in the mutant. But in contrast, the cells that are overrepresented in the mutant are progenitors. And so that this suggests that these particular cells might be over, um, overrepresented and that maybe this transcription factor is uh, required for moving these progenitors into a more differentiated uh, state. So if you don't have this transcription factor, you're stuck in the progenitor state and you can't differentiate into these particular neurons. So the uh, other example uh, I want to give you, so I, sh I showed you that we now can identify G modules on recognized cell states, we can phenotype mutants. But of course, this is still only very early uh, in development, this, these trajectories uh, I showed you. So what we're doing now, we're actually um, expanding these trees. And so this is work from Bushra Raj in the lab, where we basically sequence 200,000 cells uh, throughout um, um, uh, early, uh, early stages, of day one, uh, day, day zero actually, up to day 15 uh, of development uh, to reconstruct brain development. So you see it's getting more and more complicated uh, brain development, but the, maybe the most interesting uh, result is, or one of the most interesting results is that if we compare now cell types here, let's say progenitors here in, 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 the, in the late larval or juvenile phases with progenitors here, we see actually some interesting uh, differences. So I, sh I show you this on this slide. Um, so if you look at neural progenitors that we find in the embryo, so they have particular markers of cell cycle and, and pan progenitor markers, they are mostly distinguished by their position in the embryo. So there are forebrain uh, progenitors, midbrain progenitors, hindbrain progenitors. We see also some dorsal ventral uh, differences between uh, these progenitors. So the, so the major mark uh, that marks these progenitors as different is their position in, in the embryo. This is very different if you look a few days later and look at larval progenitors. So again, there are progenitors, neural progenitors, we know this from different marker genes, but now they are different, not because of their position, but because of, for example, their cell cycle status. So they're quiescent progenitors or non-proliferative progenitors and proliferative uh, progenitors. And then um, we also have um, here a radial glia, or proneural genes uh, that also distinguish between these um, uh, different um, uh, progenitors. So, so this part uh, so far, I basically told you about um, how we can use these uh, single cell uh, data to look at uh, specification trajectories, how we can look at the dynamics of gene expression, cell types, differentiation modules, marker genes. You can also identify uh, transcriptional regulators and um, also showed you how we can analyze uh, mutants. So it's a very powerful uh, um, approach and many of you of course are, are using those uh, uh, similar uh, approaches. However, there are still challenges. So for example, the scale of these trees um, of these you know, trajectories is still uh, limited. So you know, there are technical limitations, how many cells you can sequence, also financial limitations of course. It's still challenging to reconstruct complex uh, trajectories. So that's still not entirely clear. Um, how to do this for very, very complex uh, tissues. Uh, so this is still a huge challenge for, for example, for the, for the brain development data that I, that I showed you. And of course, there's also limited uh, spatial information available uh, in these uh, approaches. And then finally, um, there's no lineage information. So the introduction of my talk was lineage versus trajectory. And of course, this doesn't tell us anything or very little about the lineage relationship of these, uh, of these cells. So in more recent efforts, we tried to combine uh, these trajectories and these single cell um, transcriptomic approaches with um, trying to, um, let's see, do I have a message here? No, okay, good. Um, sorry, I, I want to make sure that everyone hears me. Um, we tried to combine basically these lineage, um, these, these trajectory approaches with lineage, um, uh, lineage uh, approaches. And so this is work at, at, that we did with Jay Shanduri's lab where we basically uh, use CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce mutations in the genome and kind of have an accumulation of these mutations to reconstruct lineage relationships. So the principle is shown here. So we have a, a barcode with uh, Cas9 uh, sites, uh, guide RNA binding sites. And so the idea is that over development and over time, we introduce more and more mutations into these uh, barcodes. 
And so the early mutations get, of course, inherited so that you have a cumulative and combinatorial uh, addition of uh, different mutations to this barcode. And so what you end up with is, is cells that have many different um, mutations in this barcode. And then from these kind of uh, mutations, you can try to figure out what kind of common progenitors they had. So for example, here you see that all these cells here, so these are about 20 different cells, each, each cell has a, a particular mutated barcode. You see that these cells share this particular um, uh, mutation. So this argues that there maybe was a very early progenitor for all of these cells where this mutation was introduced. Then you see these cells here share another uh, deletion here, bigger deletion. And this argues that they had a progenitor, maybe a later progenitor, that, uh, where this particular mutation was introduced. So basically, you can kind of reconstruct a lineage tree, although it's, of course, not of the resolution that you want, let's say, if you look at the C. elegans tree. But still, you, put, you, you can reconstruct that there was an early progenitor where this happened, and then a later progenitor where this happened, and then, you know, later progenitors, you know, where something else happened. So you can basically reconstruct the, the lineage relationships of these, of these cells. And so now we combine this approach with single cell uh, transcriptomic uh, sequencing to basically also define the cell type um, of, these, uh, of these cells and their, and their lineage. And so um, what, we, what we see here is, the, is how we implemented this. And so we have the, the transgene, the CRISPR arrays, and then what we do, we inject the Cas9 protein and the guide RNAs against the first four sites in this barcode. And so what happens now during early development, you introduce mutations in this uh, side of the, of the barcode. And then what you do, you induce Cas9 at later stages, and you also uh, express the guide RNAs here in the more three prime region of the, of the barcode. And now they start with the Cas9 editing this region and introduce mutations, uh, deletions and, and insertions. And so then you harvest the tissue and you, you do single cell RNA sequencing. And because this is now part of the RNA, the way we made this transgene, we can get both the, the barcode and the rest of the transcriptome from individual cells. And so what you create then are these very, very complex uh, trees that you, that you see here. Um, so you see there's quite a diversity of, of barcodes. So you know, there's a lot of little uh, deletions here. And basically, so these cells, for example, would be related to each other, or you know, these cells would be related to each other, again, based on, their, um, on the mutations in their, in, the, in their barcode. But now, instead of just having the barcode alone, we also, for each of those cells, know what cell type it is, because we also isolated the transcriptome, and we're able to map it onto our uh, transcriptomic uh, data for the, for the brain. And so what you can do now, you can basically try to ask through this recovery of bar barcode and cell type, you can ask how are particular cell types related? And I'll just give you an example here. So for example, here we have um, uh, four cell types uh, in the hypothalamus of the, of the fish, part of the forebrain of the, of the fish. And what you see when we look at barcodes here, we see that these two cell types, 27 and 30, they share particular barcodes. And 20 and 28 share particular barcodes, but they do not share these barcodes with 27 and 30 or with 20 and 28. So this argues that there is a common progenitor for 27 and 30, those cell types, um, and a different uh, progenitor for the cell types 20 and, and 28. And now, of course, one can follow this up with uh, you know, more classic lineage tracing, imaging, uh, et cetera, uh, to figure out, um, um, test this hypothesis of this relationship of, of uh, different progenitors for these different uh, cell types in the, in the hypothalamus. Another approach uh, that one, uh, another um, outcome of these experiments is that one can do clonal analysis. So basically what we do now, we give every cell or almost all cells in the very early embryo, its own kind of unique identity by having this mutated barcode. And then we can look, for example, in the adult, what happened to these individual cells. And there you see something that we call a clonal dominance, where it turns out that very, very few cells, very few progenitors at the probably blastula gastrula stage, give rise to here, for example, most of the blood in the adult. So five progenitors give rise to almost 99% of the blood in the, in, in the adult. Um, same is true for the brain. So most of the adult brain uh, comes from very few progenitors that you find in the early blastula and, 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 and uh, uh, gastrula. And uh, same is true for the heart. And you also see this if you just look at all the cells in the adult or many cells in the adult, 200,000 cells, 
you see that some progenitors really just kind of hit the jackpot and take over. Um, much more than uh, what you see, for example, in the in the in, in the larva. So re you really seem to have maybe bottlenecks or hitting the jackpot or um, you know neutral drift, where some cells, basically um, early cells, basically they and their descendants take over uh, a particular uh, a tissue. So I think this is also something interesting to follow up from these lineage tracing experiments. And that's really a powerful um, outcome from these kind of um, you know, genomic approaches to, to lineage tracing. So let me end by uh, just briefly discussing these kind of lineage tracing um, uh, approaches. So they're powerful to recreate lineages, reconstruct lineages, to look at clonality. We also use them for analyzing mutants. But again, there are challenges. So they're still of limited scale, you know, particularly if you look at our hero, the C. elegans lineage tree, we are very far away from capturing, you know, every, every cell division and every cell. So this is still a, a huge a problem. And of course, there are also technical challenges um, like computational uh, reconstruction of these, of these um, lineage trees with these, uh, with these barcodes. So there's still a lot of uh, work to be done on the, on the technological front. And again, the, the spatial information is relatively limited still. And um, of course, this is not trajectory information. So the first part of my talk talked about trajectory. Um, second part talked about lineage, and it's still not entirely clear. And it's a big challenge for the field how to combine these two views uh, of development. Of course, they are related. You know, each cell here, as it you know divides and divides and divides, has a molecular trajectory. But how to map these onto each other is still a, a huge challenge. And then finally, what I want to leave you with is maybe the, the biggest challenge of all is to ask how do we interpret these data sets in order to discover underlying organizational principles. So can we, you know, this is great for many individual experiments, these data sets, and if you are interested in a particular cell type or particular organ or particular developmental system, they're, they're, they're very powerful and help us a lot in our kind of classic studies, but are there some, you know, emerging principles from these data sets? And I think the time is still maybe a little bit too early to, to give an answer to this, but I hope that some of these kind of data sets um, form the foundation of something we might call developmental statistics, where we, let's say, have you know, hundreds of lineage trees from an from a individual um, species and from you know, 100, let's say, different embryos, and then can ask questions like, how many ways are there to make a brain? So the brain of a you know, zebrafish uh, larva, they look very similar to each other, but there must be many ways to make a brain. There are many, many division patterns that, you, that can make the same number of cells. So what's the distribution of these kind of lineage trees? Um, what is the kind of most common you know, uh, motifs that one finds in these lineage trees, for example, to make a, a zebrafish a brain? So this is within a species, but also if we do lineage trees, compare lineage trees between different species, how many ways are there to make a brain between uh, different uh, species? So uh, again, I um, think uh, just made it 28 minutes, so great. Um, uh, I again thank uh, people in the lab, Jeff, Chen, Jamie, Bushra, Summer. Again, uh, Summer, uh, Jamie, and, and Jeff now have their own labs. And again, great collaborations with uh, Dan and Alon, Jay, Aviv, and, and people in, in, in their labs. And let me just end by uh, two advertisements. One, uh, Jeff talks tomorrow at 5.15. So you can even expand on this theme of single cell sequencing and, and, and trajectories. And uh, my colleague Richard Neyer has already introduced, uh, will talk about COVID-19. That's why we're all here online. Um, uh, he will tell us the latest about the ph phylogenetics of, uh, of COVID-19. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, you know, I can't answer questions now, but uh, if you have questions, please um, um, just uh, uh, send, me a, send me an email. Thank you, Alex. And yeah, regarding questions, if you put them in the question and answer box, they will be captured, and I think they'll be sent on to the to the speakers for future uh, uh, answers. Uh, but I, I think there's time for just one question, and if there is time during these talks, I'll I'll I'll, I'll do that. And here's one: uh, Andre Sa wonders that in this model of development, how cell plasticity can be integrated, since all data are snapshots of cell fates but several pieces of evidence show the potential of differentiated cells to assume different expression profiles after stimuli. Yeah, this is, that's, a, that's a fantastic question. So when you build these trees, you can actually, if you can catch the intermediates to the next you know, kind of more stable uh, state, you can actually catch, if you can catch those, 
you can actually make the connection from one state to another. And actually, I didn't talk about this, but Jeff, in, in, in the paper that we published a, a couple of years ago, discovered actually through exactly this kind of approach that a cell can be plastic, it can move down one trajectory, the, the notochord trajectory, and then still at a relatively late stage of, of, of its differentiation, move over and become a precordal plate cell. So if you want to read that paper that we published a couple of years ago, I think that actually nicely illustrates uh, how you can capture, despite taking snapshots, uh, these, these uh, moments of, of plasticity and the trans differentiation and trans specification. Great. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to our next speaker, which is Sue Biggins from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, uh, who will discuss detecting and correcting errors in mitosis. Sue? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation. And thank you to GSA for pulling this together. Uh, since I can't take a lot of questions, I just wanted to mention I'm happy to be contacted later through email or Twitter or whatever to answer any questions. So today I'm going to talk about our work detecting and correcting errors in mitosis and I'll review some background and earlier work that sets the stage for the unpublished work that I'll talk about today. So I just want to remind you cells have to inherit the right chromosomes when they divide and this is an extremely dynamic and complicated process and I thought I would remind you by showing you movies that illustrate just how dynamic it is. So here on the left is a normal cell. And the chromosomes are shown in white and the microtubules that move the chromosomes are shown in green. So I'll start the movie and what you're seeing here are microtubules capturing those chromosomes and then pulling them to opposite poles to ensure that each daughter cell inherits chromosomes. Now this is a really dynamic process as I said and it turns out to be very error prone. The microtubules initially capture the chromosomes in, in a random manner and so it's very easy for there to be mistakes. And I thought I would illustrate that in this movie here on the right of a cancer cell. So the process looks the same, but if you look up here towards the left, you see entire chromosomes that don't get captured properly and then end up um, missegregating. And so this is called aneuploidy and it's the most common chromosomal abnormality in cancer cells. So the process of segregation then, it's mediated, as I said, by um, kinetochore microtubule attachments. So what happens is their spindle poles nucleate dynamic microtubules shown here in red. And then each chromosome shown in blue has a huge protein complex that's called a kinetochore. And this is the machine that gets captured by the microtubules to physically pull the, um, the chromosomes to opposite poles. Once every pair of chromosomes makes proper attachments, to the microtubules, the cell enters anaphase where the chromosomes get pulled to opposite poles. Now for this process to happen correctly, every pair of duplicated chromosomes or sister chromosomes has to make what we call bi-oriented attachments, where each sister kinetochore binds to microtubules from opposite poles. However, as I said, this process is really random. Initially, the microtubules just try to capture the kinetochores however they can. So there's actually a lot of incorrect attachments that can occur and they're illustrated here. There's mono-oriented attachments where one or both of the sister kinetochore is attached to microtubules from one pole. And there's even meritelic situations where a single kinetochore can attach to microtubules from both poles. And so a major question then is um, how do cells distinguish between these different attachment states? So pioneering work from Bruce Nichols many years ago showed that cells appear to detect tension. So when these proper bi-oriented attachments are made, the sister kinetochores, as I said, they're attached to microtubules from opposite poles, and the chromosomes at this point in the cell cycle are physically held together by cohesion. And so this puts the kinetochores under tension. And in vivo, we know that once these kinetochore microtubule attachments come under tension, they're actually very stable. In contrast, incorrect attachments lack tension. And in vivo, these attachments are unstable. They need to be turned over at a high rate to give the cell a chance to make the correct attachment again. So we've been very, very interested in understanding how these incorrect attachments are both detected and corrected. So work from many, many labs over the years have elucidated an error correction system that uses this Aurora B kinase. 
So when there's an incorrect attachment that lacks tension, like this one shown here, this mono-oriented attachment, the aurora B kinase phosphorylates kinetochore proteins, and that phosphorylation destabilizes the attachment between the kinetochores and the microtubules. And then that destabilizes it to get rid of the error, and it gives the cell a chance to then make the proper attachments again. So for many years, my lab's been interested in understanding then, um, how can tension actually regulate the enzyme activity of this kinase? And additionally, are there other mechanisms that ensure the tension-dependent stabilization of attachments? And these are hard questions to address in the cell. Um, it's difficult to manipulate forces in the cell. And so many years ago, we decided to try to really address these underlying mechanisms that we needed to um, do a reconstitution. So we reconstituted kinetochore microtubule attachments under tension in vitro, and we did this in collaboration with Chip Asbury's lab at the University of Washington. And I'll briefly explain how we do this. Uh, we take microtubule seeds that we attach to a cover slip, and then we can grow dynamic microtubules from the cover slip just the way they grow in the cell. They can, um, they're dynamic, they grow and shrink just like microtubules in the cell. We then purify kinetochores, shown here in green. We purify these from budding yeast cells. And what we do is we attach them to beads, and these beads sort of take the place of the chromosomes. And what we can do then is capture those beads in an optical trap or a laser trap. So we capture the bead in the trap, and then we use the trap to position the kinetochore at the tip of the microtubule so that there's a kinetochore microtubule attachment. And then because this is a laser trap, we can exert as much tension as we want on the linkage between a single kinetochore and a microtubule. So we set up this system and um, it gave us the chance then, oh, I should mention, right, there's no lysate, no Aurora B or ATP in this reconstitution. So in this um, reconstitution, it turned out we had no post-translational modifications at all and there's no lysate to provide additional factors. Okay, so it gave us a chance then to ask what the effect of tension on kinetochore microtubule attachments is. And so the idea here is to measure the lifetime of the attachment. So how long does a kinetochore stay attached to a microtubule tip over a range of forces? Now just to remind you, tension usually destabilizes attachments. So a typical protein-protein interaction, as you increase the force, you're gonna decrease the lifetime of the attachment. And this is um, the theoretical curve for what that would look like over a range of forces. The lifetime would go down. So we set out to ask how the kinetochores behave. And so um, at low tension, at two piconewtons, we found that on average, the kinetochores could stay bound to the tip of a microtubule for about 20 minutes. And then what we found is as we increased the force, strikingly, uh, as we got up to about five piconewtons, the kinetochores could actually stay bound to the tip of the microtubule for almost an hour. So tension was stabilizing the attachment. And then as we increased the forces, we started rupturing the kinetochore from the microtubule tip. So this um, was a really interesting finding because it showed that kinetochore microtubule attachments are intrinsically stabilized by tension. There's something about high tension that's promoting the interaction of the kinetochore with the microtubule tip and something about low tension that's, that's destabilizing it. And you can think of it like those finger traps where when you pull on them, they get tighter. And as I said, there is no Aurora B kinase or other post-translational modifications in this in vitro reconstitution. So this was a big surprise for us because it showed that um, there's an intrinsic mechanism to stabilize kinetochore microtubule attachments that's completely independent of Aurora B. And so obviously the next question then is, so what are the factors that are involved in this mechanism since it's clearly independent of the Aurora B error correction system? We became really interested in a protein called, it's a, fam, a family of proteins, uh, C, it's called CHTOG in human cells or STU2 in budding yeast. And this family of protein has multiple cellular functions regarding microtubules and the cytoskeleton. So it localizes to the spindle poles and there it's involved in nucleating microtubules and helping to organize the bipolar spindle. It also localizes to microtubule tips and it's been shown to regulate microtubule dynamics. It has a microtubule polymerase activity to promote the growth of the microtubules. And it's also been seen to localize near the kinetochores. 
However, it's been unclear if it has a function at the kinetochore, and that's because it's difficult when you knock it out, it affects so much of the microtubule cytoskeleton that it's difficult to know what its kinetochore function is. So we were very interested in the possibility that it has a specific kinetochore function that might be independent of its roles, other cellular roles. And we realized that our reconstitution system would be a way to address this because in our reconstitution, we would be looking at just the function of the, the population that's on the kinetochore. So Matt Miller in my lab, a former postdoc, set out to do this. And um, before I show you his data, I wanna remind you, this is the curve I just showed you how the wild type kinetochores behave as we, um, as we put them under tension, how long they stay attached to the, to the tip of a microtubule. And before I show you Matt's data, I wanna show you a mutant in a major microtubule binding protein. This mutant is called the DAD1 mutant. We purify kinetochores from cells lacking this protein complex, the DAM1 complex. And they are, this is one of the major microtubule binding proteins. So what happens here is if you look at the, um, the lifetimes, these kinetochores are so weak that we can't really even measure any lifetimes. They barely stay attached to the tip of a microtubule at all. So Matt set out to ask how kinetochores lacking STU2 behave. And so he purified kinetochores uh, from, a, from cells where he had completely depleted the STU2 protein. And shown here in green are the lifetimes that he measured over a range of forces. And I think what you can see is really interesting behavior. Getting rid of STU2 completely converts the kinetochores into acting like typical protein-protein interactions where as you increase the force, you decrease the lifetime. And really interestingly, if you look at low forces here, you can see that getting rid of this protein dramatically improves the ability of the kinetochore to bind to the microtubule tip. So we improve the ability, suggesting that normally this protein is involved in releasing kinetochore microtubule attachments at low forces. So this was the first factor we had identified that's required for this intrinsic tension sensing mechanism. Okay, so since uh, Matt identified the role of this protein in vitro, we've been very interested in, in the new data I'm gonna talk about today, which is what is the role of this protein in kinetochore function in cells? And is this actually a conserved function? Um, and so again, all the work's been done by Matt Miller. He's currently, um, he started a faculty position at the University of Utah, and then a current postdoc in the lab who's done a fantastic job, Jay Carmen. Uh, bringing human cell work to my lab. So Jake started out trying to understand what's going on in human cells. And so now this protein in human cells is called CHTOG, which is what I'll generally call it for the rest of the talk. He decided to analyze the localization of this protein carefully during mitosis to see if it's really a kinetochore protein. And this protein is very difficult to work on. It's very large. And it turns out we were very lucky um, because we were aided by the fact that our neighbor down the road, Linda Werdeman, had genetically engineered HCT116 cells where she had endogenously tagged the, the CH TOG alleles with GFP. So there was no overexpression in these cells like previous localizations of this protein um, had been done on. So it gave us a way to look at the endogenous protein. So Jake carefully looked through mitosis and these are representative images, immunofluorescence images, the DAPI to show you the chromosomes is on the left, and then the TOG staining is next to it. ACA is an inner centromere marker, so the kinetochore is localized near the centromere, so we use that as a proxy for the kinetochore localization, and then there's a merge on the right. So early in mitosis, CH TOG is on the centrosomes or the spindle poles, and we don't really see it on kinetochores. Once the cell enters pro-metaphase, we start to see little puncta that co-localize near the ACA staining. And um, in metaphase, you can clearly see the, the staining that looks like it co-localizes with the ACA staining. And so it looks like it's on kinetochores throughout the rest of mitosis. So this looked like um, to us that, that CHTOG is a kinetochore protein in human cells. And of course, the problem is, is that this protein also localizes to the microtubule tips. So Jake wanted to ensure that it was a bona fide kinetochore protein by depolymerizing the microtubules and seeing if there's still a population on the kinetochore. So this is just one representative cell here. These are nicotazole treated cells. 
And you can see that um, when we the cortisol treat the cells, there's a large amount of CH Tog that goes on to the, to the centrosomes shown here. But I hope you can see that there's still some puncta that co-localize with ACA, um, suggesting that it is indeed a kinetochore protein. So we next wanted to know how does it get to the kinetochore? And in yeast, Matt had shown that the NDC80 kinetochore protein was required for um, the localization of the, the STU2 protein. So Jake tested whether this is true in human cells. He started out by immunoprecipitating CHTOG. So he expressed a triple flag tagged version of CHTOG and then immunoprecipitated it shown here. And then he probed for the NDC80 protein and you can see in this IP that they nicely co-associate in human cells. Uh, there's no background in a cell where he did, there was no uh, tagged CHTOG and then you can see gap DH is just a, non, is a specificity control for the IP. So it looks like TOG associates with NDC80 in human cells. And I won't show you the data for the sake of time, but then Jake went on to show that the kinetochore localization in the cell does require NDC80, just like in yeast cells. So the localization of the protein to the kinetochore seems to be mediated through this conserved NDC80 protein. And I should say that this is one of the major microtubule binding proteins um, in eukaryotes. Okay, so then of course we were interested in knowing specifically what the cellular kinetochore function of this protein is. And this is, this is a really challenging uh, problem. So this is a huge protein and I'll just tell you in human cells it's over 2,300 amino acids. So it makes genetic manipulation extremely challenging. Um, and it has multiple functional domains, which I'll introduce here. So these are just um, cartoons of this protein, this family member in some different organisms. And what you can see is they all have these TOG domains and they have variable numbers of them. And TOG domains bind to tubulin dimers and this is what helps to mediate the microtubule polymerase activity of this protein. All of the proteins have what we're calling a basic linker. This is a stretch of highly charged positive amino acids and it's been implicated in binding to the microtubule lattice. And then all of the proteins have a C-terminal domain that binds to different proteins in the cell to mediate the different intracellular locations of this protein. And so the question is, how can we identify a mutant that specifically affects the kinetochore function but doesn't completely destroy all of the microtubule-based functions for this protein? So we really needed a separation of function mutant. And you can see that that's challenging given the size and, and all these conserved domains that are involved in microtubule function. So Matt and Jake set out to ask, is there a conserved domain that might specifically affect kinetochore function? So we decided to go back to yeast where it's much easier to study the proteins. And Matt, in collaboration with Trisha Davis's lab, did cross-linking mass spec to look for interactions between STU2 and the NDC80 complex. And so these are in red are shown the cross-links that they detected. And I'll draw your attention, um, one region that they, they detect across links in between the NDC80 kinetochore receptor and STU2 is that very C terminus that I mentioned is responsible for localizing the protein. And that actually showed that the C terminus of STU2 localizes it to kinetochores in yeast. However, you'll see, um, I'll draw your attention here, it turns out there's a lot of cross links between the NDC80 protein and this basic patch um, in the STU2 protein. And so we became very interested in this region of the protein. So Jake and Matt set out to ask, are there actually conserved residues in this basic patch that might mediate protein-protein interaction? So they did an alignment of different um, fungal, um, different fungi, and what they found was very interesting. In this basic patch, was, which I should mention, this whole region is about 100 amino acids. They found a 15 amino acid patch that's highly conserved, shown here in this red box. And I just want to draw your attention as well. There were two extremely conserved basic residues um, in, in, throughout fungi here. So we were really interested in this because, as I said, Previously, this, this whole region, this basic linker had been implicated as just being a positively charged region of the protein that had, um, it, it wasn't implicated in having any sort of protein-protein interaction 
domain. And so we wanted to ask specifically what the function of this little patch might be. So what Matt did is he took cells, yeast cells, that where he had fused the endogenous 2, two protein to the auxin-inducible dagron so that in the presence of auxin, it would kill the cells. And what he did is he expressed various mutants. So he took those cells and he expressed the wild type STU2 gene, and that's shown here. And these are serial dilutions of yeast cells on either DMSO or on auxin. And you can see that expression of the wild type gene in the STU2A cells completely restores viability. He then deleted the entire approximately 100 amino acid basic linker. And that's shown here. And you can see that the cells died and that, that's consistent with previous work that suggested this is an essential region of the protein. He then asked how important just those 15 amino acids are. So this is just that 15 amino acid conserved patch I just showed you. And um, he found that that is also essential for viability. So of this entire region of the protein, just these 15 amino acids are, um, are required. And he asked if they're sufficient by making a mutant where he deleted the entire linker and then just replaced it with the 15 amino acids. And you can see here, those 15 amino acids are sufficient for viability for the cells. So we don't think that the function of this basic linker is just to provide a certain amount of positive charge because the entire function of the protein can be um, carried out with just these 15 amino acids. And if you remember, I pointed out there were also two basic residues in here that we were interested in. And I won't show you all the data, but Matt showed that those two basic residues in that patch are essential. So this was very interesting to us, and it suggested that perhaps the function of this linker, there was more to it than just um, being positively charged and binding to the microtubule lattice. So we wanted to know, is this patch conserved in the human protein, and would it give us the ability to make a mutant in the human protein that we could study? So Jake went ahead and looked carefully at the basic linkers in different organisms, and, and you can see it's not very well conserved, but he did notice right away that those two basic um, residues are highly conserved. So he made this mutant in the human um, gene, CHTOG, and for the rest of the talk, I'll either call it the KK to AA mutant or the basic pair mutant. So he made this mutant, and the first thing he did is ask, is this essential for human cell viability? So to do this, what Jake did is he knocked down the endogenous TOG gene with siRNA, and then he just quantified cell viability. So when he knocked it down, you can see um, the cells died, which had, it, it was previously known to be an essential gene. And then he could rescue that by expressing a codon optimized CH TOG that was resistant to the siRNA. And you can see he can um, restore viability with that mutant or that that wild type gene. He then did the same thing with the basic pair mutant and now you can see that when he expresses the basic pair mutant he can no longer restore viability. So this mutant is essential. Um, this mutant leads to inviability in human cells and I forgot to mention the protein levels of these two um, were very equivalent. So we don't think it's just that there's protein stability problems. Okay, so the obvious question then was, what's the phenotype of this mutant? And as I said, this protein has many functions. And so Jake set out systematically to ask if the different functions of the protein are affected in this basic pair mutant. So we wanted to know, are the spindles normal? Are microtubule dynamics normal? And does this protein regulate kinetochore function in cells? So I'll walk you through what he did. The first thing he did is look at spindle assembly. And so wild type cells form these nice, normal bipolar spindles. And it had been previously shown that knocking out CH TOG leads to a high percentage of multipolar spindles that look like this on the bottom. So Jake quantified this um, in wild type cells where he didn't, in, um, didn't knock down TOG. The majority of the cells make nice bipolar spindles. And just like previous studies, when he knocked down CH TOG, he saw a high proportion, almost half of the cells made these multipolar spindles. He could then um, rescue that by expressing the wild type CH TOG gene and um, get bipolar spindles again. And then when he expressed the KK to A, A mutant, even though the cells were dying, they formed, norm, they formed bipolar spindles. So he didn't see this multipolar spindle phenotype. So that was good because it looked like this um, mutant could support bipolar spindle formation. So we next asked, are microtubule dynamics normal? 
And I won't go through all the data here. I'll just tell you the assay he did. He tracks microtubule dynamics using uh, cells that have an engineered EB1 M cherry protein. And EB1 tracks with microtubule plus ends. And so this is what he does. He does turf microscopy and follows these comets and then quantifies how fast they're traveling. And I, as I said, I won't go through all the data, but basically he found out that the basic pair mutant does have normal microtubule dynamics. So the spindles can form and the microtubule dynamics that we quantified appeared to be normal. And so um, we naturally were wondering, had we identified a separation of function mutant um, that's defective in the kinetochore function? So Jake, to, to, do, um, to analyze this, started by looking at chromosomes in these cells. And he looked at chromosomes alignment in, in the um, mitotic cells. And in mitotic cells, as I said, attachments are initially random, so you have a lot of unaligned cells with unaligned chromosomes, and eventually at bimetaphase, the chromosomes are all nicely aligned at the metaphase plate. And so if you just look at a population of mitotic cells in wild type, about half fall into each category. And what Jake noticed immediately in the basic pair mutant is that he could not, he had trouble ever finding aligned chromosomes. The predominant phenotype was these bipolar spindles where you can see chromosomes scattered all over. And the kinetochores, I should say, are shown in pink here. And in addition to having a, a huge chromosome alignment defect in these cells, the other thing Jake noticed is that the kinetochores are attached to the microtubule tips. So if you look at this blow up here of just one, the microtubules in green and the kinetochores in pink. And so the kinetochores are attaching to the microtubule tips. And this is very reminiscent of what a defect in the Aurora B kinase looks like where you can't correct errors. So you initially make all these incorrect attachments, but the cell doesn't know how to correct them. And so it suggested to us that maybe this protein is involved in error correction in cells. So to test that more, carefully, Jake did an error correction assay in human cells. And we modeled this after an assay developed originally by Tarun Kapoor's lab. What they do is they add an inhibitor called STLC. It's an inhibitor of the egg 5 motor protein, and it causes the spindle holes to collapse. And they collapse into a monopolar spindle, but the, the microtubules reach out and make all these incorrect attachments with the kinetochores. So you can really accumulate a huge number of incorrect attachments in the cells. Then what you do is you wash out the inhibitor and in wild type cells, the cells undergo error correction and then they can carefully and correctly align their chromosomes. However, a defect in error correction such as an Aurora B mutant, what will happen is that the, the spindle will form, but then the, you never correct the error so you can't align your chromosomes carefully and they have all these incorrect attachments. So Jake performed this experiment. He knocked down the endogenous TOG gene, and then he expressed the wild type or the, um, the KK to AA mutant. And then he added STLC to induce monopolar spindles. And then he waited two hours to allow erroneous attachments to be made. And then he washed out the inhibitor to allow um, error correction to happen. And and so I'll just, I'm going to summarize this. I just cut the, all the data down into just the key points here. So when he was expressing the wild type TOG at time zero, and this is time zero after washing out the STLC, there's almost no chromosome alignment. Um, again, because the STLC was effective, but an hour after he washed it out, he, um, the cells made bipolar spindles and they had aligned the majority of them had aligned their chromosomes because they'd undergone error correction. And then in the, um, in the mutant, what he found is that the STLC worked fine. And an hour later, the cells had made bipolar, they had made bipolar spindles, but the predominant phenotype is that the chromosomes remained unaligned like this. So they didn't undergo error correction. And he did a couple of other assays I don't have time to talk about to really suggest that the defect is an error correction. So we think that taken together, our data suggests that this protein has a conserved kinetochore function and its function is to destabilize incorrect attachments that occur. So finally, just before I stop, I'm just gonna, um, ask, I'm just gonna um, show you that it doesn't seem to be acting through Aurora B. So we measured a Aurora B target, uh, which is serine 55 phosphorylation 
information on the NDC80 protein, and we found that that target has, um, is not affected when we knock down TOG, but when we used an inhibitor against Aurora, it was knocked down. Okay, and I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to quickly finish by saying, just to summarize then, we think that there's multiple mechanisms that ensure the tension-dependent stabilization of attachments. There's this canonical Aurora B pathway, and then we've identified an intrinsic pathway that we think uses a conserved protein called CH-TOG or STU2. And it's interesting to think about why cells use multiple pathways, but perhaps they respond to different forces at the kinetochore and monitor different changes in kinetochore microtubule structures, plus or minus tension. And so um, speculatively, how we think it might be working, as I showed you, it interacts with this NDC80 protein. So at low tension, perhaps it pushes NDC80 off the microtubule to help destabilize the attachment. Okay, and I just want to summarize by thanking everyone. Um, as I mentioned, Jake and Matt did all the work I talked about today. They were helped by Rena Evans, a talented tech in the lab. And we've had a lot of help from neighboring labs, um, especially Chip Asbury, who's, it's been a phenomenal longstanding collaboration with the in vitro work with his lab. And then I'm grateful to the rest of my lab shown here on the right. And as I said, I, I'm not gonna take questions, um, but I really appreciate you listening and I hope this, you enjoy this meeting. It seems fantastic. And like I said, just get in touch with me individually if you wanna have questions. Thank you. Great, thanks Sue. Okay, so now before our next talk, uh, GSA President Denise Montel will present some GSA awards to two of our colleagues. Denise? Great. Um, let me just share my screen here real quick. Okay. Um, so uh, today we're going to be presenting two of the 2019 GSA awards. Um, in both cases, the recipients elected to defer the presentation ceremony until 2020 so that they could be with their community meetings at TAGC or as it turned out perhaps at least virtually. So first um, I'm delighted to present GSA's uh, 2019 Elizabeth W. Jones Award for Excellence in Education to Bruce Weir of the University of Washington in Seattle. The Jones Award recognizes individuals or groups that have had a significant sustained impact on genetics education at any level. The award was named for Elizabeth W. Jones, who was a renowned geneticist and educator, who served as GSA president in 1987 and as editor in chief of genetics for nearly 12 years. Bruce Weir is recognized by the GSA for his work training thousands of researchers in the rigorous use of statistical analysis methods for genetics and genomics data. In the words of Trudy McKay, one of the award nominators, Bruce has made outstanding contributions to the training of basic and applied population and quantitative geneticists from across the globe for more than 40 years. The award is bestowed in part for his creation of the acclaimed Summer Institute in Statistical Genetics. The goal of the Institute is to strengthen the statistical and genetic proficiency and career preparation um, of scholars from all backgrounds, especially those from groups historically underrepresented in STEM. The Institute has been tra training graduate students and other scientists for 24 years. This summer marks its 25th year, this time online. The Institute's scope is international. It's been held in more than a dozen countries and trained more than 10,000 researchers around the world. Bruce is also honored for his popular graduate level textbook, Genetic Data Analysis, the third edition of which is soon to be published with co-author Jerome Boudet. His contributions to training also include decades of work with a growing number of forensic geneticists. He co-authored the textbook, Interpreting DNA Evidence, with forensic scientist Ian Ebbett and he continues to work with FBI researchers on national committees to help develop legal guidelines for interpreting DNA evidence in court. For this exemplary service to genetics, education, and beyond, please join me in thanking Bruce. Oh, thank you, Denise. Will I be able to share my screen and show some slides? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, maybe you could show, I have two slides. Could you show those for me? Uh, here we go. I've got them. All right. So thank you very much, Denise. It's a great uh, honor and great pleasure to receive this award, of course. Uh, let me just go back one 
So just some acknowledgements. First of all, to Beth Jones, as Denise said, astounding leadership in genetics education. And I'm certainly grateful to the GSA and the nominators for this award. Thank you. We've been lucky to have good funding uh, from federal agencies. NSF has uh, funded us now for, for, for four cycles and NIH has long-standing support for us. And of course, mainly this award recognizes the, the tremendous effort done by many people into the Summer Institute. First of all, the staff from the Bioinformatics Center at North Carolina State and now the Biostat Department of the University of Washington. Over the 25 years, we've had 200 superb instructors from the US and around the world, and of course, several thousand participants, mainly graduate students. It's been a lot of fun to work with them. As Denise said, we're going to go online this year. It'll be an experiment for us, but judging by this morning, it should be very successful. So that'll be July 13 through 31. Each of our channel, each of our modules uh, on a particular topic will have its own YouTube and Slack channels, and we'll have Zoom presentations, both pre-recorded and, and, uh, and synchronous. We do have funding for um, US graduate student scholarships. We encourage applications. They should open on May the 4th, as will registrations. We're particularly anxious to increase our diversity. So we would appreciate any help in getting the word out to underrepresented populations. Our website is shown here. You can go to the Biostat Department, University of Washington, and we'll be happy to receive email uh, inquiries. So thank you again, Denise, and thank you to the society. It's been a great honor. Great. Let's move to our second award. And if I can get this all figured out right. <laughs> um, I'm working on sharing my screen here, but I can't. Okay. Bear with me one second. I think I have to. Having little trouble sharing my screen, but it's the uh, little green button at the bottom. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm aware. I'm just. I don't have that button. Bruce, have you stop right sharing? Now. Sorry. Maybe Bruce has to stop sharing. Yeah. I for some reason the button does not seem available to me at this moment. But in any case, let's um, let's go ahead and go on with. Um, the 2019 George W. Beadle Award, which is awarded to Michael Snyder of Stanford University. The Beadle Award is named for George W. Beadle, who shared a Nobel Prize with Edward Tatum in 1958 and was the 1946 GSA president. The Beadle Award recognizes a significant sustained service to the genetics community that goes beyond an exemplary individual research career. Mike Snyder is recognized for both developing and disseminating widely used technology for genome-wide analysis. His sharing of tools and resources has set a high standard of service to the community and helped lay the foundation of systems biology. Early in his career, he took a systems level approach to studying yeast gene function. The resulting large-scale transposon tagged yeast gene libraries were made freely available to the genetics community before publication, along with the associated analysis tools. From there, Mike has continued to generate new and widely used methods, resources, and approaches. For example, with Pat Brown, he helped develop chip chip technology, the precursor of chip C. In 2000, paradigm sequencing and other technology devised by the Snyder Lab revealed widespread structural variation in the newly sequenced human genome. Data and analyses from the Snyder Lab were an integral part of the ENCODE project. The consortium changed, uh, charged with cataloging functional elements of the human genome. Snyder's group contributed more data sets to ENCODE than any other laboratory. His team also co-invented RNA-seq technology and built the first proteome array. In recent years, Snyder has been setting the stage for personalized medicine at an omic scale. Notably, he used himself as the initial test subject for integrative personal omics profiles, or IPOPs. The project has generated clinically actionable health outcomes, not only for him, he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes during one study, but for many other IPOP participants. He has continued to make data and resources from these pioneering studies freely available. 
In the words of John Carlson, one of the award nominators, he has shown great leadership as an innovator, a disseminator of new technology and knowledge, and a community builder. Thank you, Mike, for your many contributions to the field. Well, thanks, Denise. Uh, I really am honored and uh, very humbled to be receiving this award. Um, uh, you know, it's an amazing group of people to be uh, put into that group, and I have to say I've always wanted to be a member of the Beatles. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I guess really the thanks goes to my lab. I've been really fortunate since I started at Yale in 86. I have a, just an amazing group of people. They've been quite incredible. I think most people tell you they're 10 times smarter than me and it's continued all the way through to my time here at Stanford. Uh, I also want to thank my family who has put up with me, you know, working long hours like all of you I'm sure online and traveling a lot. Uh, and now they're even putting up with me while I'm at home. I must be driving everyone nuts. So uh, that's very kind of them. But finally, I want to thank GSA, which uh, is a pretty unique and incredible society. It really fills an important role that, if you think about it, there's no other society out there that does what this group does. And it's, if they're standing up for model organisms, which are just the premier system for which to do science. So I really want to thank GSA for everything it's doing. So again, thanks. Uh, I do appreciate it. Okay. I guess we're ready to head back to Mark and finish up this morning. The okay. Thanks, Denise, and congratulations, Bruce and Mike, and thanks to both of you for your service to our field and to our community. Okay, our next speaker is Cassandra Extabor from Harvard University, whose talk is entitled Haystack to Needle, Moving from Quantitative to Developmental Genetics of a Reproductive Trait. Cassandra? Thanks very much, Mark, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here. I'll try and uh, share my screen. I hope it goes okay. Just bear with me one second. I organize and center here. Please, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see those slides? Yeah, that great. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, it's great to see all of you here and I can thanks and I appreciate so much all of your attendance and especially the organization and the inspiration of the GSA or, you know, literally on the same day as realizing and making a decision that it was too just for public have to have a meeting in person, deciding that same day that the meeting had to go on and that the GSA was whatever it took to the virtual experience. So I can't thank this group of scientists enough for still trying to continue our science in the face of what we're dealing with. So what I'm trying to tell you about today are some efforts that my lab has been making in a series of projects over the last eight-ish or so years. And we've taken a number of different approaches to trying to understand the same thing, which is the genetic and evolution basis of regulation of reproductive capacity. And uh, before I do that, I just want to let you know that just like GSA is still continuing uh, to help scientists do and share our science, uh, many other institutions that we work with are doing so, and the Harvard Quantitative Peak Institute continues to do so. We'll continue to run some research, research programs that are for fellows, actually. So if you're interested, uh, don't forget there's another place where you can continue to do science now and contact me if you have any suggestions. So, so the people who started this line of research in my lab were my first grad students around uh, a little over 10 years ago now. Andre Green running his own lab now at Muslim and Ian Sarakaya at UC Earth. And uh, Sam Church, a subsequent grad student, did this work, brought phylogenetic comparative method, and extended our field work in Hawaii, which I'll come to at the end. And then current lab members, Leo Blondell, a systems physicist, and Tarun Kumar, a developmental geneticist, have uh, done most of the work that, I, that I'm going to show you in the first 20 minutes of the slide. I see some of you are commenting that my audio is garbled. I apologize for that. My network is not honest. What I'm going to do is um, I can turn off my video, and that might help a little bit. Okay, if anyone really hates the video turned off, just let me the Q&A. All right, so animals, use. they have to do it for the survival of the species and have continuity and the strategies that they do this are very variable. Some organ like 
our own species, make small numbers of offspring or two of my parents for offspring, pretty small number. These spiders that we use to work with in the lab produce a few hundred offspring every few days for many weeks. They have very different in uh, levels of maternal investment and the uh, production mechanism for gametes and for zygotes. And all of this variation is something we're really interested in ending at a developmental level. What are the cells doing to create the structures that allow reproduction to happen? The genetic level, what are the genes that control the behaviors of cells to do these things? The ecological environmental level, how do environmental non-genetic factors impact the operation and evolution of the genetic program to give rise to variability in reproductive capacity? So what we'd like to do is find ways to link these multiple levels of biological control. And so I'm going to tell you about different ways that over the years we've attempted to do this. We've taken classic developmental genetic and developmental biological approaches, observing, counting, interfering with genes, seeing from the cells. We've borrowed lessons from our colleagues in the field of quantitative genetics and tried to see how we can extend the findings from architecture, the genetic architecture of reproductive control to eventually go down to genetic and other mechanisms of reproductive control. And finally, we've done some field work with natural populations so that we can try to make all the uh, area of biological organization combined because in natural uh, environments where these patients are living and evolving and where their genomes and changes in their genomes are being read out in sort of real fitness values in, in reproductive capacity at every generation. All right, so pre-offspring is common. There are a lot of different factors that can go into raising or lowering offspring, as you can imagine. And the study system I'm going to talk about is an insect study system, and we're going to be talking only about insects of the uh, genus Sophila, in fact. So the sort of insect versions of a lot of these questions you could ask in the following ways, and how quickly do you produce your gametes and so on. And these two features here, how many reproductive uh, gamete producing units do you have in, in insects, we call them ovarials and testioles, and how many can you put out uh, how many fertilized eggs can you just get out of the stem in a given time? These are the two phenotypes that we've been really focused on. So let me tell you a little bit about these phenotypes so you understand the anatomy of the system. Insect ovaries are bilaterally simple, like human ovaries. Unlike human ovaries, they're extremely organized into egg-producing uh, lines called ovarioles. Ovarioles are really important to us because they are the eggs are produced. And because it's a qualitative trait that can be measured and confirmed statistically, it also happens to predict peak fecundity extremely well in some insects in Drosophilus. And peak fecundity means the numbers laid on the day of a female's life when she will lay the most eggs she's ever laid in life. That number is peak fecundity. Drosophilus, the real number and peak fecundity are very closely correlated. And as a result, in some insects, including at least these drosophilids, it's possible that ovarian number is going to tell us something about lifetime reproductive capacity. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just moving the chat window over <clears throat> in front of me. All right, let's go back here. All right, so insect ovaries are organized in a very nice quantitative way, which is handy for storing phenotype. And um, you can see the example uh, of correlation between ovarian number and output in these two insects here that we work with. Drosophila melanogaster doesn't have that many ovarials as insects go. It lays some moderate number of eggs. This cricket has an order of magnitude more ovaries and has an order of magnitude more eggs a day. And there's a huge amount of variation of ovarial number across insects and even within the Drosophila, which is why we find it very helpful to study. So how do you make ovarials? If, as developmental geneticists, we're interested in the developmental genesis of this feature that's so important for reproductive capacity. Well, what you do is you make a series of cells and you make them stack into uh, sort of pancake-like stacks or coin-like stacks. Elements. Here, what we're showing is the developmental progression from the second, third, several stage root to the pupil transition and terminal filament cells, as we call them, to express specific genes, change their shapes, change their morphology. This is an important process because each one of these stacks is going to give rise to a terminal filament, and each one of these terminals gives rise to an ovule. 
So to solve the question of how many ovarials are made, what we want to solve is the question of how many terminals are made. Let's see how that goes. All right. So let me tell you about the first of our approaches, this developmental genetics approach. What we did was we started with a candidate gene approach, making some educated guesses as genes that might be relevant. And then we use those as a springboard to do a series of modifier screens to find a genes that might be interacting with those first candidates to regulate these features. So our candidate gene starting point was this signaling pathway called the HIPPO pathway, which is coming across all animals. And in all the animals, what it does is it tells cells whether or not they should be eating, so it controls a cell proliferation among a number of things. When the PIPO, when the pathway, which consists of a number of different signaling pathway members, is functioning normally, we have aerial development. Our species, uh, uh, what this means is you make a ring aerial and you lay about a couple hundred eggs for, for three females per five days. And these are those phenotypes you can score instantly. Now, if you abrogate HIPPO signaling function, what you'll get is you will get too many cells of all kinds, including the need to make the ovarials, and or you'll get too many ovarials, and you'll end up laying eggs as well. So you'll have increased fecundity. And if we uh, have a loss of condition of Yorkie, which is this downstream transcription factor that participates in signaling uh, cascade, what you'll do is you'll get more cells of all kinds in terminal filament. So you'll get fewer ovarials and you'll lay fewer eggs as a consequence. Now we realized after uh, that the hippo pathway was involved in ovarial number of relation was to show that a uh, hippo uh, loss of function condition, which is here we're, we're calling it uh, TJ hippo RNAi, we used a specific uh, tissue-specific driver called TJ and hippo function just in somatic cell in the ovary. What that does is increases the ovarial number as you can see on the right and you can lay on the left, and we can push that even further by further not adding an AI dose of this just laid the found for us to be able to do a modifier screen. So what we took our candidate and said we're going to enter into this modifier screen, and we did three screens. Our first screen was the if knocking down readings in the soma of the ovary gave us eggs. We did the mating count of the eggs. And then we took genes that had significantly affected egg laying, and we asked if they had also affected ovarial number, either in a knockdown condition on their own or in a knockdown condition that was dependent on a knocked background of hippo RNA. And so what were the genes that we tested as candidates? We figured other signaling pathways, not hippo signaling, were probably relevant. We tested all derived as members of all the known signaling pathways across animals. It's around 700 genes in the Drosophila genome. So what did we find after screening all the genes? What we found was that it was very common for reduced egg laying to be explained by reduced egg number, as you might predict from how I've explained the production of the animal. So what we've plotted here in order to compare the phenotypes, which are obviously very different quantitative phenotypes of egg laying and over number, Instead of comparing absolute numbers, we'll compare how away from a standard deviation, how many deviations away from the mean was the given value for a phenotype that we were scoring. And so that's the Z score, the number of standard deviations away from. The mean. And if we compare here Z scores for fecundity on the X axis, that's our egg laying, and ovarian number on the Y axis, we can see that very often down here in the bottom left quadrant, when we decrease fecundity, is correlated with some ovarial makes sense. And also sometimes lay more eggs, we have higher for we can have higher ovarial number. But what's interesting to me is it's not always the case that we have these positive correlations. Sometimes we can lay fewer eggs even though we have ovarials. And sometimes we can throw ovarials and yet lay more eggs than normal. Okay. And so this speaks to the clear flexibility and probable functional separability of different aspects of what is the reproductive capacity as a whole. So those of you who love cell signaling might be wondering, well, signaling pathway is the most important one, and you're all winners because the answer is all of them. All signaling pathways are essentially equally impactful when it comes to regulating ovarial number, both with gain of function and loss of function conditions, where we target so relatively up relatively downstream members of these pathways, all these genes are involved. So to get beyond the lots of genes are involved step, we wondered if we could notice any pattern across genes of how they're involved in regulating these different phenotypes. 
So we applied a sort of a cis biology network analysis approach to the positive case that emerged from our modifier screen. What we did was we used a previously established seed connector algorithm that works as is shown in this slide here to ask how these candidates might interact with each other. We took a predicted protein-protein interaction network for Drosophila. And what we did merged the studies of other scientists based on high throughput protein interactions um, and genetic interactions that have been documented in flight or databases. And then we say, let's say that we start with a small network made of what we call C genes. C genes have dark black circles and they're genes whose function we actually tested in our screen and found that are effective phenotypes. The gray circles here are genes that we have not tested in our screen, but based on protein-protein and genetic interactions, they're predicted to have something to do with the genes that we did test. And then we ask if there are any paths that suggest a connection, functional connection between these genes that can connect our C genes with each other and our C genes with other genes out there in the, in the possible network space. And what we do is we try to get in an iterated set of steps, the most number of lines connecting the seed genes and the smallest number of lines that can connect them all. And sometimes what we can do in order to get them to be more connected with each other is to add these blue circles that we call connector genes. These are genes whose function we have tested yet, but based on the connection they have with genes we have tested, maybe they could also be involved in regular these phenotypes. This is a hypothesis we're generating that then we will test. And so we go through this network creation in an iterative set of steps. And what we do is look for networks that have most numbers of connections between genes, and we want all of our seed genes to be connected. And what we found when we exercised was a very interesting set of interactions between the genes. They didn't form a massive, uniformly connected hairball. They formed tight tighter knit groups of genes with pre-interactions that we have to test later, predicted interactions that might affect one phenotype not the other, or in the case of the work I'm showing you here, predicted to affect all of the phenotypes that we looked at, egg laying, ovarian number, with or without the hippo, knock down and brown. The size of um, the size of symbols is telling you the size, the phenotype, the size of the phenotypic effect, and the symbols is the effect was negative or positive on uh, ovarian number or egg laying. All of genes that are predicted to interact with each other somehow affect both egg laying and ovarian. And what's interesting to us are the genes that are triangles, because those are genes that we haven't really tested, but that are predicted to have something to do with these phenotypes. We found that our genes could be clustered together in significantly tighter groups of predicted interaction that would each specific phenotypes, again, providing new uh, hypotheses for specific genetic regulatory networks that might, inter that might affect these different phenotypes. And finally, we asked if there was any sort of practice to using the systems biology network analysis on our, our list of genes from the screen by asking this network analysis if new genes that I wouldn't have thought of when I started the screen. And it turns out the answer is yes, and not for the time to be useful to us. So we took, for example, these connector genes that are predicted to be involved with genes we tested that we had tested originally. So we took these connector genes, all of them, and we asked by RNAi uh, methods if they affected the phenotypes that they were predicted to based on who they were associated with in the network. And a lot of the time they did. So we, changed, we could change their color from being blue on no and green or red in many cases, in cases where the RNAi long to test. And the proportion of genes that we tested that actually affected our phenotypes in a significant way was high enough, again, to be useful to turn up another dozen or so novel candidates. And so here you can see that three different phenotypes, egg laying is EL, hippo-dependent egg laying, and hippo-dependent ovarian number, we can recover a positive hit rate so we can correctly identify genes affecting these processes a lot of the time, actually even more the time than found when we had started our original screen using all the signaling pathway genes. All right, let me shift now to an alternative parallel approach that we were also to try to find new genes involved in ovarian number and reproductive capacity. And this has to do with taking advantage of the work that our colleagues in quantitative genetics have been doing for many days 
starting with the results predicted from their quantitative genetic analyses and asking if we subject those predicted candidates to functional testing, can we uncover yet more genes that might be interesting for us? Now, we know that variable number is quantitative. You've seen this. It's polygenic. Many genes are. And as well, uh, like other polygenic quantitative traits, QTL analysis has been a useful way to study this for many scientists over decades. It's interesting to note that depending on the species and the strains involved in the analysis, not all, it's not always the case that the same regions of the genome are predicted, though. Uh, to be involved in regulating these phenotypes or in explaining evolutionary variation between lineages and phenotypes. Trying to go from regions of the genome that are predicted to vary between evolutionary lineage in a way that explains the evolutionary version and their traits, going from that prediction, which is a statistical association, to causal involvement of specific genes is not trivial. It depends on all the things that one can't always control, including recombinant dynamics and the annotation and recombination status. So, and it's also not common, and it's challenged technically to perform systematic functional tests of all the genes that might be predicted in a given um, QTL uh, region. What we did our best to try to gather genes that were predicted to be in regions of the genome where variability in the genome sequence correlated with variability in that trait or variable number in this case. We took candidates uh, offered by uh, the work of previous colleagues and we tested them for knock effects. If we knock down the function of that in, in the ovary while it's developing, can we affect egg laying? Can we affect ovarial? And our goals were to identify novel candidate genes that regulate a variable number, and we made some progress there. All of this is unpublished, by the way. We also would, would like to understand whether or when how the lot values uh, are related to the functional elements of these genes. So lot scores are a metric that emerge from QTL analyses that suggest the degree of uh, involvement that a particular genome might have in explaining variation in a trait. And so often researchers focus on low side regions of the genome, higher LOD score that's potentially being more relevant to explaining evolutionary variation. We wanted to know if these LOD scores were more relevant in explaining functional involvement of genes. And finally, we wanted to see if we could use these steps to eventually understand interspecies variation in gene expression and function that might explain interspecies variation of variable number. So the procedure here is similar procedure for the first screen on, this can, on the signaling candidates. What we did was to first do a score for egg laying, and then if we found not that unaffected egg laying, we took those genes and asked if ovarial number was also affected in these genes. And what we found that um, a little less than half the time, we could find that the genes predicted in these QTL regions to be involved were indeed involved in egg laying, that's our primary screen, and then if they were involved in egg laying, they went into the secondary screen. Most of the time, they were also involved in their variable number, which was pretty exciting. So we got a very high hit rate of candidates from one screen to another, which was useful. And about 40% of all the genes that we tested that were predicted in these QTL loci are functionally related to a variable number here, which is a, which is a great, um, it's, it, it provides a lot of new testable hypothesis and mechanisms to work on in the future. And just for comparison to remind you, in our candidate gene um, screen for the signaling pathways, we had a hit rate, it was still you know, around 20%, and a slightly higher uh, hit rate in our predictive um, network approach. With respect to LOD scores, though, what was really interesting is that whether we picked up genes from the peaks of LOD scores, which is often we will focus our attention when we take genetic studies, whether we focus our attention on these genes and peaks or genes from very low LOD regions, we still found in both types of regions very high incidences of involvement in our phenotype of interest. And in fact, they were very similar to each other. And that was true for both of the phenotypes that we scored, both egg laying and ovarian number. So this was exciting to know as well, because it means that as functional developmental geneticists, we need not restrict our attention when we look at the QTL analyses done in the future to those very high lot score regions. Actually, the entire QTL could be really interesting to look at. Finally, I'll know before I section that we did these screens with two different tissue-specific drivers. Both of them drive expression in the soma, so not the germ cells, but the soma of the ovary while it's developing. But 
They do so at different intensities, at different levels of gene expression, we believe, and they also are different in terms of their pleiotropic expression. And we did this to sort of um, robot control in some sense for the feedback that we were getting. And what and was compare the results if we drove it in the SOMA with method one or method two, and methods one and four called C587 and BAP2, did we get the same results? Quantitatively, we did almost every time, um, but we did get quantitative effects. Some of the genes had much, some of the drivers had stronger effects on ovarian number than this. And what this um, representation of the data here, so <clears throat> excuse me, we're sort of going across um, the, the genes are not in any specific order, they're in the order that they appear on the zones of Drosophila on the x axis. And the y axis is showing us how different was ovarial number in these knockdown conditional mark controls. <clears throat> and the difference is positive, we increased ovarial number above zero or negative, we decreased ovarial number. And two favorite candidates that we or other people could explore that might reveal new genetic mechanisms involved in ovarian that haven't been looked at before uh, are revealed by these genes. So this gene here caused us the largest increase in the number when we knocked it down in the somatic gonad. It encodes for DARP, with it, which is a component of the apoptosome. And the role of apoptosis and apoptotic cell death in ovarian determination has not been explored well to our knowledge. So this could be a key element of the developmental mechanism that we could explore in the future. And then here we've got a phenotype that we've seen before, which was really mind-blowing. These animals have no variables at all. And I have an idea that might explain why this is the case, that I'll explain at the end if I have time or if I'm interested. Um, and the gene whose knockdown induces this type of phenotype is called COI, and it's a glycogen that's important for tape junctions. And uh, so again, you know, you can direct message me if you want to hear my talk on how that might be involved. But that was a new fun. All right, so in the last few minutes, I want to tell you about our initial attempts to link what we've learned in the lab about what the cell behaviors and what sorts of um, um, gene regulatory operators might be important to control ovarian number. We want to see if we can link those to ecological factors. We want to ask if these mechanisms that we determine in the laboratory are even relevant in natural populations or not. So what we do is we go to the field we collect from natural populations. We bring them back to the lab and we analyze their various reproductive phenotypes in a phylogenetic frame. So the genus Drosophila, I would mentioned earlier that there's a lot of variation of aerial number, a couple orders of magnitude. And here is a limited phylogenetic tree showing you the Drosophilids whose genomes were long ago since and made publicly available with how many ovarials they have per cell. And there's some variation, you know, the lowest is Shelia, about seen, and then you can sort of double that and go a little bit more in some of the other flies. They went to Hawaii to study this problem, not for the reasons you might think, but because the variation in Hawaiian ovarian number is much greater than that of all of the rest of Drosophilids combined. We can find Hawaiian Drosophilids view as just one or two ovarials, and you can find Hawaiian Drosophilids that have as many as almost 100 ovarials. All right, so we can use this system, we hope, as a natural uh, population system to ask the molecular and genetic basis of evolutionary variation in ovarian number. And we can ask how and whether the mechanisms that we find operating in the lab are relevant to natural populations. We know from longstanding work of in the field that these flies have evolved specialized habitats. They don't just live anywhere, they evolved to live only on specific plants native to Hawaii. And so we ask how those ecological niches might intersect or impact on their ovarian numbers and their reproductive behaviors. So DM in her first field trips and then Sam later on went to all these different sites in Hawaiian Islands that are shown here in the map. Uh, DM brought them back to the lab and Ken Kanashiro and Alulu was instrumental in letting us in those lab codes initially and helping us figure out how to use them. And as much as possible, we then uh, analyzed these larvae involved and, and looked at their different phenotypes, ovarian number, egg laying, and so on, in a phylogenetic context. And so what you're seeing here, the details of this phylogeny are not that important, but the key is to note that there is a, a sort of a correlation between where they live, which are the colored left, and how many ovarials they have. 
And in general, the more specialized or usual or rare their substrates, like this blue box is flower, is a specific type of flower. This red box is spider egg cases. The fly will only lay eggs inside the spider egg case. The rarer and the more specialized habitat, in general, the fewer adults they tend to have. And indeed, not, this is not just a correlation, but when we apply phylogenetic statistical methods to this, we find that the best statistical explanation for the phylogenetic distribution of where they lay their eggs is, is, uh, is their ovarian number. In other words, it's likely that ovarian number is actually adapted for these different niches where they're living. And finally, we found good evidence that the uh, numbers of ovarials that they have might be determined by the same types of mechanisms at the cellular level as we've seen in Drosophila melanogaster in the lab. So if we compare a number of different Hawaiian Drosophilids here and we look at how many ovarial, how, how many terminal filaments they have um, as uh, large, I'm sorry, and how many filament cells they have, we see that the two are very tightly correlated, and that tight correlation is seen as well in Melanogaster, and that's part of what suggests to us that similar development mechanisms are operating, not just in our lab populations, but also in these wild populations. So, in summary, we've managed to at least make some beginning connections between these different levels of organization. We've learned that proliferation and morphogenesis of the cell in B are important, and that all conserved signaling pathways are probably relevant here. And that systems level network analysis was also informative in finding some new genes. From the work of quantitative genetics colleagues, we've been able to do some functional testing and uncover yet other classes of new genes that we wouldn't have found even in low log score regions. And from natural populations, we found evidence for a value of ovarial number, as well as evidence for the relevance of the lab um, discovered mechanisms that we know about to control these traits. So finally, uh, of course, going forward, we'd like to know what the mechanistic relationship is between different pathways that control ovarial number, what aspects of genome architecture that we haven't considered yet might be impacting the architecture of the trait in terms of ovarial number, and finally, how evolution of global gene expression across lineages might help us understand whether and how um, ovarial number has evolved over the course of Drosophila evolution. So I'd like to thank you for your patience through uh, technical glitches and thank the team that makes this work possible. And I don't believe I have time for questions, but I would love to hear them from you via email anytime. Thank you. Thanks, Cassandra. And in addition to uh, the email questions that you'll likely get, there's some questions in the Q&A box that you may want to um, answer. Okay, and so our final speaker. Those right there, right? You can answer those right in the, in the question and answer box right now. Yes, you can do that. Okay, and our final speaker in this first keynote session is Ed Buckler from Cornell University, uh, who will tell us how biology and breeding may contribute to improving food systems and climate change. Ed, welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, first, I want to, again, emphasize that TSA uh, administration is just a wonderful job in pulling this meeting together. And the second thing is I want to mention that I was a postdoc at Bruce Weir. And like all of his graduate students and postdocs, Bruce is an amazing teacher and set off dozens of us off into wonderful careers and uh, was a real model uh, for a mentor. So I want to talk to this broad community here, though, about how we can start taking in the great biology we've already heard about and combining that with breeding to uh, potentially affect and improve our food systems and climate change. So I want to first mention that this work's been supported by the USDA and the National Science Foundation. And the uh, applied side has essentially been supported by the Gates Foundation USD, USAID and the Department of Energy. I've also had the incredible opportunity to collaborate with uh, well over 1,300 different collaborators from around the globe. And here's a few of the groups we're collaborating with now. I'll structure this talk in a way that, because we do both basic science and also with all these collaborators, applied science. And I think it's really important when we go from that breadth to understand what are the developmental goals, what are the hypotheses, and how are we linking them together. 
And Jeff Moores has developed a really neat way to think through that and discuss it. It's called Go High, and I really recommend people take a look at that. So what's your a gloomy vision for global food insecurity? Well, we'll uh, see another three, four million people on the earth, and the vast majority of those people will still have very poor diets going out to the end of the century. Uh, whether that's poor nutrition, too many empty calories, there'll be a billion, two billion people out there with insufficient uh, calories or protein. But I think we can change this. And a lot of us are working hard on trying to do that. I think we really can, by the end of the century, get to a healthy globe where we've dramatically reduced the number of people who have insufficient calories, whether that's through alternative proteins and adapted productive row crops. And by dealing with uh, improving quality of diet, getting people access to quality fruits, vegetables, and microbial foods. And I think together, that would dramatically improve the quality of life across the globe. The second big challenge and vision, I think, is by the end of the century, uh, we can probably get to uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission negative. Of course, it's going to require all sorts of changes in our energy systems, but it will also require uh, carbon removal technologies. And this is where, the, as a plant breeder, we think we can contribute to start uh, pulling uh, greenhouse gas and, uh, gases out of the atmosphere. So what's our lab mission? It's to accelerate plant breeding and improve global health uh, and carbon sequestration. What do we define breeding as? Well, it's really the design and selection of organisms for human purposes. And so that can be through transgenics, CRISPR editing, but also it relies on all the natural variation that's already out there that we can select very efficiently today with genomic tools. Why do we work with plants? Well, from that health point of view, our fruits and vegetables are really key to those healthy diets. And from the point of view of how we support the entire planet in terms of food and carbon sequestration, Plants are 82% of the globe's biomass. And so they, along with bacteria, really are the dominant players on the entire globe in terms of biomass. So in the last century, there's already been a tremendous improvement in the way we do breeding. Species like maize yield eight times what they did 100 years ago. Um, and that uh, progress really came about by making crosses, inbreeding, and doing this cycle and cranking that cycle uh, every five years, and it works. In the last two decades, though, the shift has been to uh, genomic selection, where, we're, of course, we're still making those crosses, but with a really good mathematical and statistical model, you can predict the best varieties coming out of those. And with complete knowledge, you should be able to make this whole system run 15 times faster than what we were in the past. The question and what the rest of this talk is about is how good can we make this model? How fast can we go? And there's been a lot of progress already in this for about a dozen uh, species across the globe. And most of these are focused on food yield. The issue is, in the next uh, century, this, we're really going to have to expand it out to everything from fermentation, nutritious fruits and vegetables, fuels and polymers, carbon capture, and assisted migration, as plant species have to migrate from one area to another. And so if you think about how many species that is, that means we need to get genomic selection and these types of approaches working for thousands of uh, species. And that's a big shift from our focus just on a few species to get to actually work on thousands of species. Some of this is t uh, engineering and technical. It's getting the right information systems, the right genomic tools in the hands of a diverse array of breeders. In the USDA, we've started up a new initiative called Breeding Insight to do exactly that. Uh, getting those tools out into the hands of a wide range of specialty breeders. But it also has a basic science element to it. And this is where we need to get genome-wide prediction to work in a broader range of cases. So genome-wide prediction already works quite well. If you're working in major crop species, uh, where you may have anywhere from a thousand to a million observations to train your models on, uh, the intrapopulation prediction accuracies can be quite high. The problem is when we try to make, take those models that were trained within one population and predict to the rest of the species, 
you know, perhaps sometimes the accuracy only drops by half, but sometimes it can drop to zero. If we're working on a smaller crop with fewer observations, our accuracy is gonna be lower. And so the real question uh, we're asking now is how do we make these go, uh, work better from one to another? And even if we were to take the information from a major species and apply it to specialty ones, because they're mostly based just on inheritance, there's very little transferability. So the real question is, how can we add mechanism to help these genome-wide predictions? So that in these cases where we're going from uh, one side to another in these uh, broader jumps, that we can still maintain accuracy. Is there a way we can add mechanism in to say get a 20% boost in accuracy? And this gets back to essentially what NSF would call the rules of life. Um, and I, th I think in many regards, we have a, a reasonable feel for a lot of those rules of life. What I think we need to really work on, and as we've already heard a lot today, is about parameterizing the functions of life. How do we take those rules, of get empirical data in there, and really understand the functions across uh, life? And when we look at this across a wider evolutionary perspective, where we go from everything from bacteria to archaea to eukaryotes, how do we take that information that we've learned from all these other species and start applying it to this little clay down here, which are the flowering plants that only evolved about 130 million years ago, but now are this dominant player in the bio world's biomass. So, Essentially, three hypotheses we have. The first is that essentially the biophysics of how proteins uh, function, their activity and flux, that can really be parameterized across all of life. The second hypothesis is that, that chromatin expression translation, the central dogma, should be parameterizable across all of eukaryotes and transferable into plants. And the third hypothesis is that the physiology that we see of how you take this metabolite and build it into a larger organism, there's valuable equations and functions we can derive across all of the land plants and in order to make and drive better models. And so if you think about this from a coding perspective, what do we want to do? We essentially want to make a transferable genotype to phenotype model that allows us to go from DNA to RNA pattern to protein activities to component traits to predict uh, a phenotype. So where are we with transferring these parameterized models across species? First thing I wanna mention is that when we work across this diverse evolution, it's really key to train machine learning models and all of these models uh, with evolution, not against it. We certainly have tried to fight evolution in some of these cases and have lost. And I would just highlight that uh, Ai Wong and Jacob Washburn last year published a really nice paper on exactly how to do that. So the first uh, hypothesis I want to tell you about is that one that Sarah Jensen had, that proteins have a similar evolutionary response to temperature and that we could train this uh, across both bacteria and archaea and eventually apply that to eukaryotes. The first thing that she and Emery uh, Simon did was essentially she had to come up with an estimate of what are all these organisms adapted to? What temperatures are they adapted to? And so what they did is they developed a machine learning model uh, where they related optimal growth temperatures to tRNA structure and were able to create models both within archaea and bacteria that accurately predict where those uh, organisms optimal growth temperatures were. With this, she then had a model and a way essentially to train PFAM domains uh, from essentially across life. So in, in this, she was able to use those estimated gro optimal growth temperatures, alignments of various PFAM domains, and essentially then do GWAS between the two of them. And various uh, sub-hypotheses she was able to test. First, that uh, PFAM composition was definitely affected by temperature in almost all PFAM domains. PFAM thermal adaptation is highly pyelogenic. It's likely that uh, hundreds of thousands of residues across the genome are involved in thermal adaptation. And finally, she's testing the question about whether or not there's convergence on whether archaea and bacteria residues by residue 
are uh, involved in thermal adaptation. And you can find out more about uh, uh, her work in that and where she is with that uh, a week from now uh, in one of the live sessions. The second hypothesis uh, I wanted to talk about is how can we transfer that chromatin expression and translation uh, across the eukaryotes? So a couple of years ago, Catherine Mejia and the group started creating machine learning models using KMERS to ask questions about can we identify chromatin accessibility. Came up with powerful models that allow us to walk through a big genome-like maze and identify where those open chromatin regions are. She then followed that up by collaborating with uh, Celia and Zhang's group to essentially start creating machine learning KMER models to, uh, for well over 100 uh, transcription factors, where the group had collected these with ChIP-seq data. Again, she was, they were able to create uh, high quality and highly accurate models. But then she wanted to use those models to get back to this question we have about the angiosperm gene regulatory grammar and whether or not it's shared. And so the, what the analysis she did, she took these uh, KMER models, which were at the scale of a nucleosome, about 150 base pairs in size. She clustered them uh, together. Uh, and then rem the, all of these models were created in maze and she clustered them together. And those cl that clustering pattern is shown here on the left. Then she colored that clustering by where the, the transcription factor families from Arabidopsis. So this is a species that's diverged by 130 million years. And what you see is that those models of binding uh, recapitulate the clustering uh, that's known from Arabidopsis. So essentially what we're seeing is you know, f quite stable transcription factor binding uh, systematically across the board here. So it does look like there really is a shared binding grammar that's going on. Uh, Travis Reitzman asked the question, can you take a, a transcription factor binding model that you trained in Arabidopsis and where can you apply it to? He took models for one of those TFs. Uh, this is our recall precision. And of course, when you took it in Arabidopsis, applied it to Arabidopsis, it performed well. When he took, trained in Arabidopsis, applied it to maize, didn't do as well, certainly better than the baseline. But then he decided, let me see if I can start training it on both Arabidopsis and maize data, and then predict Arabidopsis, the held out uh, Arabidopsis or maize data. And what he found was essentially, he was able to eat, maintain equal precision uh, when he had a model that was trained on both species. He, there was no loss by that generalization. And so this is starting to suggest to us that we can start probably creating models across a wide range of species uh, and start transferring them uh, to others in a very quantified way. Hai Wang and the group uh, created a series of machine learning models using convolutional neural nets to predict uh, absolute expression levels using the cis regulatory elements and uh, UTR sequences. And so because we're not including any information on trans uh, aspects, uh, getting to 50% accuracy is actually uh, quite accurate. Uh, for this type of model. So we create those quantitative models and then Travis Reichman again uh, took those models that were created in maize and had never seen Arabidopsis before and just asked the question, how well do they transfer across to Arabidopsis? And so they weren't as accurate. They lost about half of their accuracy, but they were still far, uh, much more accurate than uh, random. And we are now getting to a point where we think we can start training data from dozens, if not hundreds of species, and we'll see how well we can maintain, if we can maintain and essentially generalized models that predict expression for virtually any species. So when we, this hypothesis, I would say the jump across angiosperms looks like it's quite positive. Um, you know, this is uh, constrained and works. And the question I have for this community is how much can we uh, leverage right out of animals and fungi? So the final hypothesis I want to test is whether or not physiology can really be parameterized across land plants. 
And the physiological trait that I'm most interested in is the physiological trait uh, having to do with yield and heterosis. Maize uh, is, uh, breeding was really built on managing uh, this. And we know that deleterious mutations are really at the heart of this. And a lot of that understanding goes back almost a century now. But the question is, can we parameterize this at the level of uh, single residues? So the hypothesis we're, more specific hypothesis we're testing here is, can, is selection against functional loci, is it consistent across the angiosperms? We know there's gonna be a lot of individual genes, individual cases where it's not consistent, but in bulk, is it consistent across the angiosperms? And so the prediction would be that then angiosperm conserved sites will predict segregating deleterious mutations. Eli Rogers Melnick and the group a few years ago essentially lined up uh, maize versus a wide range of other plant species, and he found about 10% of the genome was alignable and constrained. Uh, these then, that constraint was then used to identify potentially uh, putative deleterious mutations in a wide range of species. And essentially, uh, these angiosperm deleterious mutations should be in rich low recombination regions according to population genetics, and he saw that in maize. Ramu Puna uh, had the prediction that we would see an increase with vegetative propagation, and he tested that in cassava and uh, saw that, yes, there was an, an increase in these deleterious mutations through vegetative propagation. And then finally, uh, these de putative deleterious mutations should explain field uh, phenotypic variants. And we've seen that both in maize and sorghum, where they're sometimes explained up to half of the field variants. But we also wanted to say is, are we estimating these well enough that we can really increase our, uh, our increase our prediction accuracy? And Guillaume Ramstein has been asking this question. He d used a very large population of biparental hybrids and tested it in a set of diverse hybrids. And for certain traits like plant type, really there was no difference between the two of them. The, those GURP scores uh, show no increase over uh, the, the fault model uh, just using gene proximity. But in yield, there was an increase, a few percent, it was significant. And this is kind of the pattern we've been seeing elsewhere, that it, it helps, um, but sometimes in some, in some species, it, it was uh, very minimal and a maximum about a 10% increase in accuracy. So what's the roadblock here? Well, maybe it's our testing. We have too much linkage disequilibrium to really see the effect. Uh, the angiosperm alignments may be focusing too much on coding regions. Perhaps our predictions that, of how dominance and dosage are working are, are, are not correct. Or potentially, maybe the hypothesis is just wrong. Physiology just changes too much across species for this to work. So we started diving into some of those. And the first, one of the first areas was a, a model uh, that Jim Bertzler has advocated for a number of years about how important dosage is. When you have balanced dosage across all of the genes, an organism will be healthy. When you have unbalanced dosage, you end up with uh, lousy looking organisms. They don't grow very well. And so deviations and expression really matter. So we tested that a couple of years ago and Carl Kremling did this where he looked ranked expression across a wide range of maze uh, lines for uh, all of the different genes. And then asked the question, how much enrichment was there for rare alleles? And what he saw was both at the lowest expression levels and the highest expression levels, there was an enrichment for these rare alleles. So it lo does look like extreme expression and potentially deleterious expression is enriched uh, with these mut potential mutations. He also then took a quantitative model and said the deviations in expression should be able to predict uh, seed weight or other yield type characteristics. And he did see that it essentially explained anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of seed weight variance, just those deviations. So I think there's good support for this as being one of the issues. The problem here from an applied point of view is the transferability of dysregulation or rare is poor. We really need much more of a mechanism of what that actually means in order to transfer it. So this is where we're starting to dive in on a narrower set of germplasm uh, to ask this. And we're starting to work with a tribe of grasses called the Andropogonae. And they diverged from one another about 18 million years ago. 
there we're going to sampling 900 uh, genomes from these, and these is in collaboration with Toby Kellogg, Matt Hufford, Jeff Rosabar, Adam Sipo, and Chi Sun. The key thing is they do share this one type of uh, physiology in terms of photosynthesis and a similar developmental pattern. But by sampling this many species, we capture about 1.5 billion years of total evolutionary time across these various lineages. And one way to think about it, it's really about saturation evolutionary analysis of a similar physiology. Every ancestral base pair has been mutated about 50 times. And so by sampling across here, we're gonna be able to measure constraint directly. So we're starting to get the data back from this and uh, Baosheng Song in the group, he's been asking the question whether or not we can understand much more mechanistically what some of those non-coding regions, uh, conserved non-coding regions are doing. And he's developed a novel alignment algorithm uh, that is sensitively identifying these conserved regions. And what he's f first found is just a check to make sure that they make sense is that the vast majority of them, about 85% or 86% of them, are regular, various forms of regulatory sequence. There's a few percent we don't understand what they are, and hopefully maybe we can learn more about the biology of those. But he then went back to that expression data and asked, you know, when we have a disruption in one of those conserved non-coding sequences, what happens to expression? And it turned out that the lowest expressed alleles out there had disruptions in those conserved non-coding sequences. So now we have a real mechanistic uh, point where we can say, if you disrupt this element, you will lose expression. So where are we with these various hypotheses? Um, on those ones about temperature and protein across life, I think we're starting to see certain classes of them we're doing a good job on. Whether or not we can bring it down and transfer it residue by residue, I think that's still an open question. It's a lot of that central dogma aspects of plant uh, of uh, biology. We see good transferability across plants. Our big question is now whether or not we can pull in the data from the rest of the eukaryotes. And then when it comes to physiology across land plants, the across what is deleterious and not deleterious it can be well defined across there. To quantify exactly how deleterious this is, we may need to work with smaller groups of uh, species. So I want to end here with the point that essentially sequencing a genome is going to only cost us about $2,500. Um, a million more spe species of eukaryotes are likely to be sequenced in the next 10 years. But if you think about functionally parameterizing a species uh, may cost you $5 billion to $100 billion. And so really, we as a community or series of communities really need to think about transferability. And so 20th century breeding success looked a lot like this with Norman Borlaug uh, developing new, help, helping lead uh, the development of new and better varieties that prevented uh, starvation from uh, expanding across the globe. 21st century success in breeding though is gonna look a lot more like this, where we in all of our communities create functions parameterize functions that we can plug together, we work together, and then we can tackle these two really big problems of uh, global health and uh, climate change. So I'll end there and I'll be happy to take questions uh, offline later on. Thank you. And I wanna thank my thank wonderful you. group. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Ed. Um, there's time for, I think, uh, one question. Uh, since climate change is going to pose a big threat to food security, do you think we should pay more attention to climate resilient plants? Yeah, no, I think uh, climate re resilience absolutely is a, a key element uh, there. And I think we're going to end up with certain uh, species where we need uh, uh, climate resilience, other species uh, we're, we're likely to have to put under, you know, greenhouses and other types of uh, things in order to maintain our productivity. So, you know, but th there will be, I think there will have to be essentially thousands of uh, solutions. Yeah, and here's one you must get uh, a lot. Aditha Chedre wants to know, uh, does artificial breeding of plants disrupt the ecological balance? <laughs> I, I would say agriculture has already uh, disrupted the ecological balance a tremendous amount. I think using uh, powerful genetic tools in many regards helps us prevent disrupting the ecological balance anymore. And I think 
if we have an opportunity to bring back a lot more ecological balance with a lot of these tools. We can repair the disruption, I hope, with uh, work like yours. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, so that concludes our first keynote session of TAGC 2020 online. Uh, I encourage all of you to use the program planner to find the links to the sessions that you would like to attend over the next five days, all beginning at 8 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The links to all sessions will be available 10 minutes in advance of the start time for the session. So I look forward to seeing you around over the next uh, several days. Uh, so long and uh, uh, thanks for attending.